Hey guys, welcome to class. We are um, doing chapter nine today. We're going to talk about the Jeffsonian era. This is the time during Thomas Jefferson's presidency. Let's go ahead and get started. Remember, you only have to write down the highlighted information. So March the 4th, 1801, Thomas Jefferson took the oath of office as the third president of the United States. It was also unique because he was the first president to be inaugurated in Washington, DC. The administrations of Jefferson, Madison and Monroe constitute the era of Jeffersonian Republicanism. This happened from 1801 to 1825. They all had basically the same ideal. It bears Jefferson's stamp and embodies his philosophy. So section one is the revolution of 1800. So looking at some of their, the Jefferson, Jefferson Republicans ideas. Their ideas were that farmers were the basis of the country, which me personally, I like that because y'all know my husband's a farmer. We live on a farm, our family's into farming and everything. And we are, the farmers are the backbone of the country. Without the farmers, you wouldn't have anything. We talk about in our, my ad class all the time that everything we do during a day can lead back to farmers, whether it is if you, um, the clothes you wear, sports even can go back to farmers because you have to have the pigs for to make footballs out of you have to have the turf companies to grow your um turf for the fields and everything you have to um have like the timber industry to make baseball bats so everything is relied on farmers or the agriculture industry so that's a pretty good thought that Jefferson had here. And then their idea was man was essentially good. And as Christians, we know that's just not true. Because of sin, Adam's sin, man is not good. We all have that sin inside us. A world of small governments without sending armies or debts was the ideal. And again, this is not a very good, good thought. And in a perfect world where everybody would do what's right, then yes, that's fine. We don't need the standing armies. We can live with small governments. But again, man is not good and the world is not perfect. So we need these governments to help us. Um, we need the armies to be able to protect us. Now, out the debts, yes, that's a good idea. It's always a good idea to be debt free. Leadership should govern with a common man in mind. Again, that's a perfect, that's a good idea because it, Shouldn't matter whether you are wealthy or you are poor, you're a common person. Leadership should govern to everybody. They shouldn't cater to one group or another. That's making some changes. So when Jefferson took office, he made some changes. Um, they repelled the Judiciary Act of 1801 and let the Alien Sedition Acts die, excuse me, expire. <laughs> They also adopted the 12th Amendment, which enabled electors to cast separate ballots for pre president and vice president. Because if you remember, what they have problems with the 18, 1800 election between which one would be president and which one would be vice president. Jefferson ended up getting president. But from this, you had to either declare you were going to be president or declare you were going to be vice president. It wasn't until later that... The president chose their own vice presidents. Jefferson wanted to reduce taxes and eliminate the national debt. Um, coming back to this idea, it seems to be a good thing. You want to, of course, low taxes are good, but how can you pay off the debt with low taxes? So you kind of have to do one or the other. You can do one first, you can eliminate the debt and then reduce taxes, but you can't reduce taxes and then pay off the debt because you have to have some kind of money to be able to pay off that debt. All right, so John Marshall and the Supreme Court. 
The Supreme Court remained under Federalist control and his first great Chief Justice was John Marshall. He was a Virginia Federalist and a cousin of Jefferson. Marshall was appointed and took office in the closing weeks of the Adams administration. Um, the Supreme Court was not as important then as it is today. The Supreme Court now makes a lot of decisions and it's always a big deal when a president can appoint a new Supreme Court justice. For instance, um, one of the current um, Supreme Court justices is about to retire, um, Justice Baylor, Bayer. I can't ever pronounce his name, Bayer. Um, he's about to retire. So Biden is going to get to appoint a Supreme Court justice, which is a big deal because that you're going to have this liberal justice on the Supreme Court for the rest of their life because justices, they don't have certain terms. They are appointed for life or until they retire. So that's gonna be a big deal in our nation coming up. So the first chief justice, John Jay, resigned the office to become governor of New York, an office that he considered more prestigious. So that kind of shows where the Supreme Court was at then. Being a governor of a state was more prestigious than being a chief justice of the Supreme Court. Nowadays, you would have governors that would love to be just a justice on the Supreme Court. Marshall was a Federalist in the mold of George Washington. He envisioned a tremendous future for the young nation as long as the central government held the power to develop the new land's potential. The Marshall Court upheld the authority of the national government and increased the scope of the court's authority. The first major case before the Marshall Court involved the Judiciary Act of 1801. Um, William Marbury was one of the judges that had received a um, commission. He was one of the midnight judges appointed by um, John Adams before he left office. And James Madison, the um, Secretary of State under Thomas Jefferson refused to deliver William Marbury's commission. So Marbury asked the Supreme Court to issue an order forcing Madison to deliver the commission. Marshall knew that he had no means of forcing Madison to obey and some Republicans eagerly awaited the opportunity to disregard the authority of the Federalist judge. So Marshall handed down a ruling that preserved the authority of the court without giving the Republicans an opportunity to defy it. Although Marbury was right in his complaint, Marshall said the power to issue such orders was not one of the powers delegated to the court by the Constitution. The law that permitted such orders then was unconstitutional and therefore invalid. Thus, the Marbury v. Madison, the Supreme Court established the principle of judicial review, the right of the court to declare a law unconstitutional. As Marshall wrote in handing down the decision, a legislative act contrary to the constitution is not law. It is emph emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Since that decision, the Supreme Court has declared well over a thousand state and federal laws unconstitutional. Looking at some more court cases. Another important ruling protected the federal government's delegated powers. These are government's powers outlined in the constitution. These powers limit what Congress can do and what they can be in charge of. On um, this particular um, case, Og Gibbons v. Ogden involved the right to regulate interstate commerce, trade between the states. In Gibbons v. Ogden, the court ruled that the delegated powers given to the national government by the Constitution could not be limited by state boundaries, meaning that you couldn't change the federal law from one state to another. The federal law was the federal law for all states. And then another case is the McCulloch v. Maryland in 1809. The state of Maryland opposed the idea of a national bank and tried to tax the Baltimore branch of the Bank of the United States out of existence. Claiming that the power to tax involves the power to destroy, the court overruled the state's action, meaning that if you can tax somebody, you can destroy them. 
So their thoughts were that the state of Maryland was trying to destroy the National Bank. So they overruled that state's actions. Necessary and proper powers that enable the government to carry out the delegated powers are called implied powers. In this decision, Marshall placed the court squarely on the side of the loose constructionists and national supremacy. The Supreme Court might have been a fearless island in a sea of republicanism, but John Marshall ensured that it was an island that Jeffersonians could not ignore. All right, next we're going to look at Jefferson and his foreign affairs, the, the way he handled problems with foreign nations. To the shores of Tripoli, you probably have heard in the song, um, I think it's the army. We will fight our country's battles on the land and on the sea. From the shores to Tripoli, we will fight our country's battles in the land and on the sea. All right, so despite overriding concern with domestic affairs, Thomas Jefferson achieved two successes in the field of foreign affairs. All right, so Jefferson wanted to reduce the size of the Navy, which was part of his plan to cut federal expenses. However, several small Muslim kingdoms in North Africa where piracy and kidnapping were chief sources of national income forced the president to reconsider his budget cuts. The ships of those Barbary states raided Mediterranean shipping and occasionally ventured out into the Atlantic. These pirates captured unarmed merchant ships, enslaved the crews, and demanded ransom from the owners. Most nations found it cheaper and easier to pay ransom to the Barbary states than to send their warships. Many countries, including the U.S., began paying an annual tribute, which is a fee or a tax to these pirates to avoid conflict with them. Um, when Jefferson became president, he wanted to end the practice. So he sent a squadron of warships to Tripoli to frighten the most important Barbary state with a show of force. In the war that followed, ships bombarded the Tripoli Harbor. This later inspired a phrase in the Marine Corps hymn to the shores of Tripoli. That was a song I was just singing. Um, we will fight our country's battles in the la land, air, and on the sea to the shores of Tripoli, something like that. All right, so the fighting began in 1801 and ended with an agreement in 1805. U.S. paid a ransom to American prisoners for American prisoners to Tripoli, but refused to pay additional tribute. But piracy, can, piracy in the other Barbary states continued for another decade long after Jefferson left, president, left the presidency. In 1815, the American Navy, with help from European warships, ended all payment of American tribute along the Barbary coast. So if you'll look here at the map, you can look over here and there is Tripoli right there it's off the Mediterranean Sea. These are the other Barbary states. These were the small Muslim nations along the coast of Africa that were charging those tributes. All right, the Louisiana Purchase. So Napoleon was the French ruler during this time. And you probably have think back to world history. You've heard about Napoleon. He worked his way up through the military ranks to finally become emperor of France. And his French legionnaires had a far reach reaching out into the world, basically trying to take over the world. So Napoleon Bonaparte, he offered the Americans all the Louisiana territory for $15 million. This was the territory that was left that they, the French had in the United States after the um, American Revolution. This was what was left there. And he was trying to finance a war with Britain at the time. So he needed the money. So he offered this territory to America for $15 million. This territory was a region larger than what was the whole of the United States at the time. Um, Jefferson sent James Monroe to join Robert Livingston, the ambassador to France. He instructed them to go to Napoleon, offer him as much as 10 million for New Orleans. Napoleon's foreign minister astounded the Americans with a counteroffer, all of the Louisiana territory, a region larger than the whole United States for $15 million. Jefferson saw that this not only secured New Orleans, but it also provided land that 
that further Jefferson's vision of more land for farmers. Jefferson, though, was a strict constitutionalist. He wanted to make sure everything went by the book and everything was strictly by the Constitution. The problem was the Constitution gave the government no specific authority to purchase land. So he had a lot of problems with that because he in the past had had problems with the previous presidents who assumed powers in the Constitution. But this was a big deal to get this land from France. So he was really torn about it. So Jefferson briefly considered requesting a constitutional amendment to permit the purchase, but his ministers in France warned him to hurry before Napoleon changed his mind. Casting his constitutional concerns aside, Jefferson submitted the treaty to the Senate. It was quickly approved. With the Louisiana Purchase, the United States more than doubled its size. So now we have this big, vast expanse of land. So the question is, what were the boundaries of Louisiana? The French foreign minister replied evasively to Livingstone that they were the same as those that France had received from Spain. Livingston persisted. What were those boundaries then? What, what boundaries did they receive from Spain? The minister declined to answer, but said simply, you have made a noble bargain for yourselves, and I suppose you will make the most of it. So basically, they didn't even know what they got. They knew they got this huge chunk of land, but they didn't know how much that land was. They really, it was unexplored territory for them. They didn't know what was there. So Jefferson decided to send these two men on an expedition to explore the Louisiana Territory. The first was Meriwether Lewis. It was his own personal secretary. And then he also sent William Clark. He was a brother to George Rogers Clark. You remember him back from the American Revolution. Um, so you had both men, they had military experience. Um, so they, they were smart, they had, they both went and they did a lot of studying before preparing for their expedition. So on May 14th, 1804, there was a group of about 50 men led by Lewis and Clark left Louisiana. They traveled up the, the Missouri River through the Dakotas and Montana and across the Rocky Mountains. As they traveled along, they picked up a, um, Shushan Indian woman and a um, French fur trader that the Indian woman was his wife. Her name was um, Sacagawea and she acted as a guide for them. She also acted as an interpreter. She would um, work with the Indian tribes to get them horses and things like that that they needed. The explorers reached the Pacific and gazed at an ocean they had never seen. The climax of the trip must have been, let's see, let's go, let's skip that. All right. The explorers returned by way of the Yellowstone River and saw much of the awe-inspiring scenery now contained in Yellowstone National Park. The adventures finally ended when the party reached St. Louis again in September of 1806. So they were gone for over two years on this expedition. Few explorations in history can rival the Lewis and Clark expedition for extensive travel, spectacular sites, and fruitful discoveries. And after, um, or about the same time, Zebulon Pike directed two other important expeditions. He was another army officer. Their, his first trip went northward to the upper reaches of the Mississippi River. And the second trip crossed the Great Plains of the Colorado Rockies, where Pike discovered the mountain that bears his name called Pikes Peak. The expedition turned southward into Spanish-held Mexico. As a result of these and other explorations, Americans learned more about their continent and could realistically begin to envision a nation that stretched from sea to shining sea. All right, so now we're gonna look at the Indians in the Northwest Territory. So as they're expanding into this land, they're going to run into problems with the Indians. The Indians were already there. The Indians had been there. So they're going to run into problems with these Indians. All 
First, we're going to take a look at Aaron Burr. Alexander Hamilton said the driving force in Aaron Burr's life was his inordinate ambition. He viewed Burr as a man without principles. Ironically, Burr had a godly heritage. He was Jonathan Edwards' grandson, and his father was a Presbyterian pastor and president of Princeton University. Unfortunately, his life was often contrary to the model of his ancestors. Though he briefly studied for the ministry, he never gave evidence that he truly professed Christ. Burr became one of the most influential men in New York. The Republicans added him to the 1800 ticket as Jefferson's running mate. In that deadlocked election, Burr denied being, denied being interested in the presidency, but rumors abounded that he was secretly hoping to win when the House of Representatives voted. Jefferson believed the rumors and never trusted his vice president again. In 1804, while still vice president, Burr ran for governor of New York, partly due to Alexander Hamilton's opposition, Burr lost. Anger, Burr challenged him to a duel. In the Burr-Hamilton duel on July 11, 1804, Burr shot Hamilton, and Hamilton died the following day. Later, Burr be began assembling weapons and supplies on an island in the Ohio River between Virginia and Ohio. Some people think that he intended to take over Mexico, and others think that he planned to lead the western states and territories out of the Union to form his own empire. Jefferson had Burr arrested and tried for, pre for treason. He was acquitted in September 1807 when Chief Justice Marshall ruled that there was not two witnesses to the alleged treason as the Constitution required. Though Burr lived until 1836, his political career was over. A little bit about Hamilton. Hamilton did not always live an honorable life. He was sometimes a political conniver, and at one point he was guilty of adultery. But his wife was an evangelical Christian who forgave his adultery, and there is some indication that Hamilton became a Christian towards the end of his life. A pastor was called to Hamilton's bedside after he had been shot by Aaron Burr. Hamilton asked to receive the Lord's Supper, and the pastor regretfully declined saying that the church did not administer the Lord's Supper in private. He then told Hamilton that the Lord's Supper is just a sign of Christ's work, but the benefits of Christ's work can be had without a, the sign. Hamilton responded that he knew that to be true. I am a sinner. I look to his mercy. The pastor then recited some scripture and shared more of the gospel with Hamilton, who replied, I have a tender reliance on the mercy of the Almighty through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. As the pastor left, Hamilton said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. All right, so now let's look at the Indians here. All right, so we're looking at the fallen timbers and the opening of Ohio. The Indians believed that the land belonged to everyone, that nobody could own the land. Um, Tecumseh, a Shoshone Indian chief said, the land belongs to all Indians and cannot be sold without consent of all. What, sell a country? Why not sell the air, the clouds, and the great sea, as well as the earth? An old Indian once complained to William Henry Harrison that the French had been friendlier to the Indians than the Americans had been. The settlers believed that the land's potential had to be tapped. They thought that the Indians were wasting the land. In 1790 and 1791, the Indians inflicted two stinging and humiliated defeats on the American army. Faced with an increasing dangerous situation, President Washington appointed Revolutionary War hero, Mad Anthony Wayne, to crush the Indians. Wayne, known for his reckless courage, staged a careful, meticulously planned campaign. Wayne and his force marched from Fort Washington on the Ohio River, which is modern Cincinnati, to a site near modern Toledo. In the Battle of Fallen Timbers on August the 20th, 1794, so-called because most of the fighting occurred in a maze of tangled trees not down by a storm, Wayne's forces soundly defeated the Indians. In the resulting Treaty of Fort Greenville, the Indians surrendered all rights to the southern half of Ohio. And then in 1803, Ohio was admitted to the Union as the first state from the Northwest Territory.
The men who fought under Mad Anthony Wayne at Fallen Timbers included Meriwether Lewis, William Clark, and Zebulon Pipe. But the two most important veterans of Fallen Timbers as far as the Northwest Territory was concerned were young men on opposite sides. A 19-year-old officer named William Henry Harrison and an Indian scout named Tecumseh. In 1800, William Henry Harrison was appointed governor of the Indiana Territory, which is modern Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and he served in that office until 1812. Harrison wanted the Indians to abandon much of their hunting and devote themselves to farming, and that way the Indians would lead a more settled life and they would not need large tracts of undeveloped forests in which to hunt. Should the Indians give up their traditional way of life, their lands would be open to American settlement. Harrison's chief adversary was Tecumseh, who led the last great Indian challenge to the United States in the Northwest Territory. Tecumseh realized that individually, the Indian rights could never stand against the United States. He proposed joining all the Indian tribes into a single confederation with himself as the head. When Harrison protested Tecumseh's actions, the Indians replied calmly that he was simply following the example of the United States and joining his people into one nation. Tecumseh began building his confederation by sheer force of personality. His persuasive speeches wooed Indians to his cause. His fearlessness and code of honor won respect even among white men. Tecumseh never tortured prisoners or attacked women and children. Tecumseh's brother was named the prophet. So that was, um, and the prophet was part of his success because of a religious movement led by the prophet. The prophet was maimed and a virtual alcoholic and he claimed in 1805 to have received a revolution for the master of life. After this experience, he quit drinking and began to preach to the tribes. Indians must reject the white man's ways, the prophet said, especially his whiskey. All Indians must learn to treat each other fairly and draw together against the governor, the settlers, excuse me, who were the offspring of an evil God. When the prophet began to win converts among the tribes of the Northwest, Governor Harrison sent a message to the Indians urging them to reject this so-called prophet. The, mes um, the message that he sent out to the Indians backfire. Somehow, perhaps through British agents in Canada, the prophet learned of a total eclipse in the sun that was, occur that was to occur in 1806. The prophet announced to every Indian he could reach that he would indeed make the sun stand still. The Indians were awed when the prophet announced, behold, darkness has shrouded the sun and the sun apparently did vanish. Multitudes flawed to Tecumseh and his brother. At their headquarters, the brothers built a village called Prophetstown in the Indiana Territory at the juncture of the Wabash and Tippecanoe Rivers, only about 120 miles from Harrison's territorial capital city. Tecumseh announced that no more Indian lands would be open to the white man without the consent of all the tribes. And Harrison knew that this demand would mean that no more land sales could be made. He met with the Tecumseh personally in 1810, but they could reach no agreement. Harrison suggested sending Tecumseh's demand to the president, but the leader replied that the president is so far off he would not be injured by the war. He may sit still in his town and drink his wine whilst you and I have to fight it out. Thinking that a clash was inevitable, Harrison decided to act quickly. In 1811, when Tecumseh was away in the South trying to rally the tribes there to his cause, Harrison took a force of some 1,800 men and camped near Prophetstown on the Tippecanoe River. In his brother's absence, the prophet ordered a night attack on the American camp, promising the charm of the white man's weapons so they would not harm the warriors. In the Battle of Tippecanoe, Harrison's forces drove off the Indians but took heavy losses. The Indians abandoned Prophetstown and Harrison destroyed it. When Tecumseh returned, he found he must begin all over again. This time, however, he had an ally, Great Britain. The U.S. and the British were about to go to war. So now we're going to look at the War of 1812. 
In 1803, Great Britain and France went to war again. The British Navy was too powerful for Napoleon to invade Great Britain. And Napoleon's army was too strong for Britain to defeat France in battle on land. As a result, each side tried to starve the other by destroying its trade. And neutral U.S. was caught between the two. When the British would stop American ships, they began to forcibly remove British deserters and put them back into service with the British. They would also take American soldier, sailors and make them work for the British. This was a practice called impressment, seizing American sailors and forcing them to serve in the British Navy. And it outraged the United States. In June of 1807, the American warship Chesapeake was fired upon by a British warship. Three Americans were killed and more than a dozen were wounded. After the American ship surrendered, the British went aboard and impressed or seized four sailors. Americans immediately called for retaliation. The Chesapeake affair nearly brought war. Jefferson, to try to um, avoid war, persuaded Congress to adopt an embargo act which banned all American trade with the rest of the world. The bar embargo ended up hurting Americans more than it hurt the rest of the world. In keeping needed American goods from Europe, Jefferson hoped to force Britain and France to lift their restrictions, but it failed. Jefferson persuaded the Republic um, in 1808, Jefferson refused to run for a third term, but persuaded the Republicans to nominate his Secretary of State, James Madison, as his successor. Madison was elected and became the nation's fourth president in March of 1809. He was a keen political philosopher. He was, after all, the father of the Constitution, if you remember back to that. In 1810, Congress tried to um, another approach to work with Britain and France with the Macon's Bill Number 2. It said that if either Britain or France would repeal its anti-trade regulations, the U.S. would continue trade with that side and refuse to trade with the other. England and France themselves would determine which side gained the trade. Napoleon did responded by seemingly repealing his restrictions in 1810. And thus, the U.S. resumed its embargo with Britain. The British correctly doubted Napoleon's honesty and rejected the offer. Despite Napoleon's continued interference with American shipping, the U.S. took Napoleon at his word and tried to force the British to comply. Both England and France viewed the American action as virtually bringing the United States into the war on France's side. The action hastened America's entering into a real war against Britain. You had a group in Congress called the War Halts. In any situation, you're going to have those who egg on a fight. And these were basically what the war halts were. They were led by Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. And they pushed for war against Britain. They believed that the British were supporting the Indians under Tecumseh in the Northwest. They were expansionists and they wanted to seize Canada. The group saw British acts, such as impressment, as an insult to American honor. And the Warhols quickly elected Henry Clay to be the Speaker of the House and began pressuring Madison towards war. Madison, he didn't need much pushing. He was one of those that, as the Warhols were standing there pushing for a fight, he didn't need much encouragement to go to war. So he asked Congress to declare war on the British for a couple of reasons, three different reasons. One, for the impressment of the American sailors. Two, interference with American trade, including seizure of American ships. And then three, encouragement of Indians against the Americans. So these were the three reasons that Madison gave for going to war with British. These were the reasons that he gave Congress when he asked them to declare war on the British. So 
the U.S. entered what became known as the War of 1812, divided and unprepared. The, not everybody in the country wanted war. So they were divided on the issue. They also weren't prepared for war. If you think back, Jefferson wanted a small army, no standing army, a small navy. So they didn't have the military support to be able to make this happen. So they're going in at a a bad place to be going into war. One advantage though for the US had at, at the beginning of the war was that the British were preoccupied in a war with Napoleon. That the Brit this is an ongoing fight between the British and the French. It had been ongoing for centuries. And so again, they were once again at war with France. So they were kind of preoccupied with that and really didn't have much time or effort or supplies to be able to put into a war with America. So we're gonna look at the course of the war. Disasters in Canada. The Americans decided they wanted to conquer Canada because they thought it would accomplish two things. So conquering Canada, they figured they could accomplish two things. One, they could eliminate the British influence among the Indians. And they'd also provide new area for the land hungry Americans. But it was a difficult cast because Canada was huge. If you look now at the map, I mean, Canada is bigger than the United States is at the time, especially because if you take out Alaska, if you're looking at the map, it is huge. So it was a lot to be able to try to conquer. And all of the people there in Canada were pro-British. A lot of the people there were um, loyalists during the American Revolution that had fled America to Canada. So these were already people who they didn't really like America. The British took Detroit after an American general surrendered his entire force without a fight, opening the Northwest to invasion. The British then rushed towards Niagara Falls. In the ensuing battle, the Americans were driven back into New York. The US's opening campaign was a fiasco. The war at sea. The disasters in Canada were at least partly offset by early victories at sea. Engagements with single British warships, American vessels fared quite well. The um, America had to build up a fleet at the time to try to, to make up for having such a small Navy under Jefferson. And one of the ships that was um, built was the USS Constitution. The USS Constitution is actually still in commission, is the oldest commissioned ship in the United States. You can actually go and see this ship now. It is still sailing. There is still a commander of that ship. It's really pretty neat. Um, but the USS Constitution and other ships defeated British ships in combat. And the USS Constitution became known old iron size because the enemy cannonballs bounced off its oak sides. The early triumphs on the high sea had encouraged the American, pu American public. And then recovery of the Northwest. After the defeat of, at Detroit, the US government gave William Henry Harrison command of the Northwest. Harrison realized he could never secure the territory unless the US controlled Lake Erie. So American Captain Oliver Hazard Perry rose to the challenge. He defeated the British fleet in the Battle of Lake Erie with a hastily assembled American fleet. He built his own ships, dragging cannons and ammunition through the wilderness to Lake Erie and used sailors, Kentucky militiamen who had never been on anything larger than a flatboat. But he was able to defeat this, these British here. In the Battle of the Thames, Harrison crushed the British Indian force. The British victory, drive for victory, excuse me. So the British devised a three-fold plan to win the war. An army would dis descend from Canada, I mean, come down from Canada and separate New York and New England from the rest of the states. A naval force would attack and raid major cities on the Eastern coast. And another force would attack and capture New Orleans, which was a big deal for the United States. 
New Orleans as a port is a big deal throughout American history. So they needed to hold on to that port. The first part of the plan failed. The Battle of Blondensburg, the British scattered a large force of American militia and cleared a path to the American capital. The sailors soon set fire to the capital, the president's mansion and several other important buildings. Madison's wife, Dolly, helped save several important items from the executive mansion before she fled, including a famous painting of George Washington. The British had no intention of holding Washington, the value of which was more symbolic than strategic. So they next turned their attention to Baltimore. Debt City, however, was protected by a larger, more disciplined force and by the well-designed Fort McHenry. The British fleet tried vainly to bombard the fort into submission. After three days of fighting, during which the British commanding general was killed, the British abandoned the task. The whole force left Chesapeake Bay and joined the effort to capture New Orleans. Just before the British attack on Fort McHenry, Baltimore lawyer Francis Scott Key and a friend sailed out to the British fleet under a flag of truce. They asked for the release of a civilian doctor, William Beans, who had been captured by the British. The British commander agreed to release the doctor but refused to allow them to leave because the fleet was preparing to attack Fort McHenry. The Americans had to stay aboard until the battle was over. Key watched the British fleet shell the fort. As the pounding continued into the night, the anxious lawyer strained to see what was happening. As the dawn broke, he saw the American flag flying proudly above the fort, signaling the bombardment had failed. Key gazed at the flag and was inspired. He began writing on the back of an envelope the first verse of a poem, why he called the defense of Fort McHenry. We know today it's a star-spangled banner. He wrote the other verses after he returned to shore. Set the to music, the poem became one of the most popular patriotic songs in America. Eventually, in 1931, Congress officially proclaimed the Star Spangled Banner the national anthem of the United States. At right, the war in the South. In the South, the War of 1812 was com complicated in a manner that the British never expected. As a result of Tecumseh's efforts among the Southern tribes, civil war broke out among the Creek Indians in the Mississippi Territory, modern Alabama and Mississippi. The conflict between pro-American and anti-American Creeks grew sharp and settlers boarding Indian lands began to suffer. The government authorized Tennessee General Andrew Jackson to help the Creeks that were friendly towards Americans and to defend the South against the British. His forces won a series of victories against the unfriendly Crees, climaxing in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814. Jackson was not a brilliant strategist, but he was a firm and unflinching leader. His men called him Old Hickory because he was as lean and tough as a hickory branch. Jackson had little time to celebrate his victory, and he had to march quickly to New Orleans late in 1814 to meet the British there. At New Orleans, Jackson stationed his troops and artillery behind fortification that included cotton bells. On January 8, 1815, the overconfident British, believing that their troops would easily win, marched directly on Jackson's lines. Old Hickory mass artillery tore huge gaps in the British lines and his frontier sharpshooters picked off those who managed to survive the cannons. The British had more than 2,000 casualties. The Americans had 13. The Battle of New Orleans was about a stunning victory of the War of 1812, but it was fought after the war was over. The treaty again signed on December 24, 1814, climaxing four months of negotiation, had ended hostilities some two weeks earlier. Slow communication from Europe, however, kept the news from America for several weeks. Nonetheless, the battle made Jackson the greatest hero of the war. And right, now we're gonna look at the results of the war. It opened the Northwest Territory to settlement. 
You had growth of American industry and manufacturing. A desire for isolationism, mean, meaning let's keep America to ourselves. Let's stay out of foreign affairs. We're not worried about them. We're just going to keep to ourselves. A sense of national pride and honor. People began to be more unified in the United States. All right, and last section here, we're going to look at the era of good feelings, the presidency under James Monroe. Secretary of State James Monroe was elected to succeed James Madison. The president's popularity and the collapse of all political opposition to the Republicans caused Monroe's two terms to be known as the era of good feelings. It was just a time where everything seemed to be working well. Everybody was getting along. It was just a good time in American history. The Federalists collapsed after the War of 1812 because they opposed the war and opposed what was happening, opposed pro progress. They just seemed to be in opposition to everything that was going on. The Hartford Con Convention opposed the war and hinted that New England might secede from the Union if its demands were not met. There were widespread public disapproval of this meeting. The treaty again in the Battle of New Orleans soon followed the Hartford Convention and removed much of the reason for its existence. The Federalist Party was dying before the war, then it was clearly dead after. Within a few years, the discredited party disappeared. So America worked to begin mending fences with Britain. The treaty again stopped the fighting with Britain, but it did not settle the problems between the two nations. The United States and Great Britain, therefore, carried out extensive negotiations to settle their differences. One of the first and most important of these agreements was the Rush Bagot Treaty in 1817, and it limited the number of British and American warships in the Great Lakes. Its provisions were eventually extended along the entire U.S. Canadian border as the nations advanced westward. The U.S. and Canada have maintained peaceful relations for two centuries with no fortifications, barbed wire, or large armies between them. In 1818, the U.S. and Britain agreed to occupy the Oregon Territory on the Pacific Ocean jointly until they could decide how to divide it. Right. Conflict with Florida. So Spain owned Florida at the time. But despite that, Jackson was sent to crush Indian opposition there. The Secretary of the State at that time under James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, he was the son of John Adams, took a firm stand with the Spanish government on this. Jackson, he said, was only defending American lives and property. Excuse me, let me, let me back up, <laughs> sorry. Adams did not stand with the Spanish government. He was firm with the Spanish government. He was saying that Jackson was there protecting Americans and Americans' property. So Adams argued the Spanish could, should do a better job of policing their territory. So they came up with, instead of risking losing a war, Spanish government decided to sell Florida. Under the provisions of the adams onus Treaty, the U.S. gained Florida in 1821 at a cost of $5 million. The U.S. now possessed all territory south of Canada and east of the Mississippi, as well as, as, well as its holdings in the Louisiana Territory. So James Monroe issued what became known as the Monroe Doctrine, and this was him saying that in 1832, he declared the American continents by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintained are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any American powers. So what he's basically saying is, Europe, you stay over there, we'll stay over here, and we're not gonna get mixed up in each other's business. You stay out of our hemisphere, we'll stay out of your hemisphere. So it established two principles. European nations couldn't intervene in the Western Hemisphere and Americans wouldn't meddle in European affairs. The Moreau Doctrine formalized America's determination to remain isolated from Europe. And this Monroe Doctrine would play a part in history for years to come, even up through the Civil War and later it would play a part. 
All right, and that's the end of our chapter. Ms. Wise has the rest of your instructions for you. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. You can come back and watch this video anytime on my YouTube channel. And I will see y'all later. Thanks, guys.